Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Unapologetically Joy. My name is Joy, I'm the host of this podcast and today we got another special guest and that is George. And George is a creative entrepreneur, a mental health queen and the owner of Borderline George. We talked about her life story and how she went from a victim mindset to taking responsibility and how she created the life that she's always wanted. And I think the story is a powerful reminder that you have the power to create the life you want. But before we begin, I want to do a trigger warning. This episode contains discussions about depression and suicide, which can be really triggering for some listeners. So if you hear this and if you're really suffering from this, please seek help immediately. And don't forget to follow us on Spotify, subscribe on our YouTube channel and follow us on Instagram and TikTok. And don't forget to leave five stars on Spotify because it really helps me to boost my podcast. So thank you so much and let's go to the episode. Enjoy. Welcome, George. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on my podcast. And um, I saw your videos on TikTok and I find it really inspiring how you present yourself on TikTok. I'm really curious about your life story. But before we dive into your life story, um, you call yourself the borderline George. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can tell the listeners what is actually borderline. Okay. First of all, <laughs> thank you for that introduction. I've never of been introduced <laughs> before. That's very kind. Um, so the name borderline George came from... Um, I was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and that's where I got borderline George the name from and borderline personality disorder is a mental illness that um, it's a very complex mental il illness that is very undiagnosed and misdiagnosed mm -hmm. so for a About 10 to 12 years of my life, I was just told she's got anxiety and depression. She's just a little bit, you know, um, she's been through trauma, yada, yada. When I was 12, I remember first going to the doctor and I recall like my stepdad took me and he was like, she's not eating, she's not sleeping properly. Like what's going on? And they basically just said, she's got anxiety, depression, has some medication, off you go. But I do recall them asking me to do a test and it came out with results that said that I had a high risk of developing schizophrenia. And that's a very complex mental disorder. And I don't have schizophrenia, but because of the things that I was portraying, it was coming across yeah. as that. And since I've done a lot more research, because once I was diagnosed at the age of, I think, 21 or 22, it was just after I tried to commit and take my own life. Um, mm. So after that, they took me a little bit more seriously um, and they finalized uh, a diagnosis and came to that conclusion. Mm. But since researching a lot more about borderline, So the term borderline came about in the 1800s, just around the turn of the century when they were doing a lot of, like, mental health analysis and there was mental health wards and stuff and they called them borderline because they were on the borderline of, like, schizophrenia and um, bipolar, I think, was the other one. So they couldn't actually mm -hmm. quite put their finger on what it was. So they called them borderline. So, like, borderline yeah. since then has evolved and changed and it's very hard to be diagnosed with it, I think, especially in Australia. More and more people since I've been diagnosed I know have been diagnosed or there's, like, ten symptoms and you have to have at mm. least five or more to be diagnosed. But a lot of people can, can show, like, one or two symptoms because a lot of the symptoms come up in a lot of other mental health issues and mental illnesses. Um, but essentially it's just a product of childhood trauma and your brain develops differently and you see and experience the world differently because you have this very deep rooted core belief of being abandoned. And basically mm -hmm. 
the underlying root cause of it is abandonment issues. And then by like one or more parent and then the parent that sort of does stay around, it is like emotional um, neglect, not on purpose usually Mm. because obviously when somebody leaves a dynamic, the other parent is just as much in distress as the children. So, um, and I'm a child of three. And I'm the middle child. Okay. <laughs> okay. You know okay. I mean that, um, the middle child usually, um, yeah, it's a lot of research. And the middle child mm. usually is the one that sort of, especially, it depends what age you are, I guess, when everything happens. Because it depends how developed your brain is already before, mm. um, you know, the abandonment goes on and the, and the emotional neglect goes on. So, yeah, I don't um I don't blame anyone. I don't yeah. hold anyone accountable, but I do take full responsibility now for it and I guess you could say I am on the other side. <laughs> I still deal yeah. with it obviously every day and I still have moments where I'm like, I don't wanna have to deal with this. But yeah. I'm a lot better than what I was four or five years ago when I tried to take my life. Well, well, it's so strong that you take responsibility because I I cannot imagine, of course, how it is. But, um, yeah, maybe you can explain a little bit how you feel sometimes. Is it like a feeling of anxiety you have or like yeah, you say so also abandonment? Basically, they say that, So if I could put it into like a perspective or a visual for you, they say that people with borderline personality disorder are like people walking around with no skin. So you imagine not having skin and like bumping into something or someone poking you or someone scratching you and it just being that much more intense or that much Mm -hmm. more like you feel it so much deeper. So, like, okay. you do feel emotion so much deeper, like you feel sadness and depression and anxiety so much deeper, but you also feel happiness and excitement and love mm. and all of the good feelings, like they're heightened. So you just yeah. feel very sensitive. They call them the sensitive chameleon souls because you are forever trying to fit in so you do whatever yeah. you can to sort of mold and change to your environment. So they say mm-hmm. that if you're in a good environment, so when you become an adult, if you're aware mm-hmm. and you can put yourself into a good place, where the, whether it's with work or friends or relationships, if you're in a good environment, you can do pretty well. Yeah. If you're in, a, in a toxic or a bad environment, you reflect that almost instantly because you feel like it's because of you. So, like, yeah. I notice when I notice a lot more because I'm a lot more aware now. I never used to be aware. Mm, um, yeah. But once I became aware of the condition and aware of my triggers because every borderline is different, they say it's the hardest, one of the hardest mental illnesses to treat because mm. every single borderline is different based on their experience based on their trauma based on their triggers so like Mm -hmm. every treatment's different because every trigger is different and each trigger will be like at a different level for different people so like something that might work for me might not work for another borderline or vice versa so um it's kind of just like this deep seated fear of being abandoned so like Mm -hmm. you perceive a lot of things differently so once you become aware of your perception of your outside world so like you you might not get a text back from someone for a couple hours and you start getting like intrusive thoughts of like you know they don't love me or like they're gonna leave me or like your energy just switches and I know that that's a symptom for a lot of other people like that yeah that perception of um you're not loved because you're not being shown it in certain ways but for borderlines it's it's much deeper than that. It could be like mm-hmm. a change, like you could be in person with someone and it could be a change of their attitude or a change of their energy or like maybe they've just had a bad day but you think it's yeah. 
or you think that you take it really things. personally yes you take everything yeah. very personally like i said it's like you don't have a skin and every mm. single little like nudge every single little thing is like scratching a sore and it's yeah. just like uncomfortable so yeah i've had to get uh, must be, yeah. very i've done a lot of like i didn't do therapy for a long time i'm in therapy now but I did research a lot of ways to overcome these things and cognitive behavioral therapy and talk therapy. Um, yeah. So like reassurance, reassuring myself, like positive affirmations and talking myself through situations literally out loud yeah. to be able to explain to myself, no, like maybe they're just busy or like they didn't mean it like that or like the way that they're treating you is actually a reflection of them rather than a reflection mm. of you, like you haven't done anything wrong. Like if you've not done anything wrong or you've not sort of done anything chaotic or manic because another way I could put it is that if you know someone with bipolar or you're familiar with bipolar, it's like bipolar but on steroids. So like bipolar is like fluctuations of mood and everything over sort of a long period of time so like you could have a manic episode for a week or two weeks or a depressive episode for a couple of weeks or a couple of days whereas borderline is like um it's not funny but if you no, know yeah you know, it's yeah it's like I could be excited and ecstatic and just like over mm -hmm. the moon and then one little thing happens and I'm like crying. But then, you know, 10 minutes later I'm laughing because I think it's funny that I find that. So like, it's just like this crazy fluctuation of mood, but very short periods of time. So like wow, something yeah. someone does or something someone says can trigger you to either go on the good or go on the bad. Mm, um, yeah, it can be very exhausting. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, more in control. It's and aware. It does get easier. Yeah, and what kind of strategies do you use to overcome these fears? Because when you're in a situation, for example, when somebody is not texting you back, or uh, what do you do? Do you talk to yourself? You said you're talking out loud, for example. I think. And I think it comes down to experience because the older I've gotten, like since I first found out, I've been able to actually look back. Like it's almost like I've got a bird's eye view of my past now and I can see a lot clearer certain situations and certain things where I could have reacted differently. So I think it comes down to experience and like the more experiences you put yourself in because a lot of the time borderlines – They won't leave their hometown. They rarely leave their, like, own country. They find it hard to leave home because, like, their outside world is just very difficult to mm. handle. If, like I said, every borderline is different, so some are much stronger than others. But you're almost like your little child is just, you're trapped in that little child mindset that mm. you were, like, when you were sort of emotionally mistreated. But... The more experiences you have that are positive and the more experiences you have that are the opposite of that belief and that, like, core feeling and the more people you have around you that are accepting of you and, like, are able to help you through it or explain it, I think the yeah. better it gets. Yeah. Because you only know what you know. So, like, you putting yourself into different experiences helps you, like, reference point back to those better experiences and be like okay it's not always like this like somebody could like people who are borderline are attracted to a lot of people like because like attracts like and so traumatized people are usually attract traumatized people and a lot of the time because we're very anxiously attached to people because you're constantly mm. fearful of being yeah. abandoned. I don't know if you're familiar with the the attachment styles, but there's four. Yeah. There's only one yeah. secure attachment, and usually anxious attachment will get, like, addicted to avoidant attachments. Because yeah, that's, true, like, yeah. <laughs> that's, like, what your core, like, familiarity is because that's kind of either what the parent was that did abandon or did leave. That's what they were like. Mm -hmm. So they were constantly yeah. in and out. In and out, and so like you're loved, but like 
you know, not all the time. Mm -hmm. We love, but like from afar, or like, yeah, it's it's mm -hmm. hard to explain, but I, it, that might make sense. Yeah, yeah, but it's really addicting because um, I also used to have a boyfriend like that that is like giving me a lot of love and then he pulled away again and then he came back you know it's it's a feeling of yeah it's almost like a drug yeah because, it is like but, a drug it can be very addicting yeah but the thing is like uh, when I finally had made the decision to broke up with him and after two months I realized like he was not that fun you know yeah but exactly. it was just the addiction yeah and you just you don't even realize at the time or in the moment, but you're just like seeking out what you only know. And so when you've not experienced healthy love or, or, you know, positive love and you're just a product sort of of chaotic environments or chaotic love, you get, um, like I said, like attracts like, and you look for those things when you're an adult, like you look for that, like push and pull and that chaos and mm -hmm. that like uncomfortable and that like, I love you, but I'm going to express it in this crazy, like, manic mm -hmm. way. So, yeah, it's yeah. really hard to... Can you hear that? Is that loud, that sound? No, it's your... okay. No, I don't I'll hear ask it. them to stop. No, I don't hear it. Okay, cool. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's just. No, maybe I hear it later, but it doesn't matter. It's, okay. uh, it's all natural. We're having a conversation, so it doesn't yeah. matter. But, um, but are you now in a relationship? No. Uh, no. Would you like to be in a relationship? Um, I think so. I do miss being connected to somebody, but it does cause a lot of, like, I think that... Drama. The, yeah, it, it's easier <laughs> being alone because you don't have as many triggers. You don't have another, like, variable. I guess you could say, because like you can control yourself a lot better when you don't have another person that you're constantly wondering whether or not they're going to leave or whether they love you. <laughs> and it's, yeah. it's sad. Like I, I do, like I was with someone for a long time and I, and I did allow, like I wasn't my best when I was with them. I've healed the most since we've been apart. But now I look back and I see how, like, differently things could have been. But at the same time, I do know that they also have trauma that caused them to show up certain ways in the relationship yeah. that also caused, caused problems. Like, I wasn't the only issue, but I do realise that it is very difficult being with a borderline. It is one of the hardest relationships to be in. I actually seen a statistic the other day. And it's said, like, that borderlines don't ever really have relationships that last longer than two years, statistically. Wow. So, um, and I guess unless you get better, unless you find someone who's really understanding and really accepting of that and you're able to work through things together. Because I think yeah. that a lot of people, when you're healing, you need to have people around you that are, accepting of the fact that you may not always be yourself you may have triggers that you're not even aware of or you may show up certain ways sometimes that you're just not conscious of until yeah outburst. or like you could be you could have had a bad day and you could be getting you know pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed by all these external factors and you get home and then like one thing is said or one thing is done and you just explode and you just yeah. like, oh my god, I didn't mean to say that. I didn't mean to do that. Yeah. Like you, you feel a lot of guilt and shame around mm -hmm. expressing feelings because you don't know how to express feelings. Yeah, it's true, and I think someone has to be like really patient with you. That's like because obviously there's those ends of the spectrum where you can be manic mm -hmm. and be out there and crazy and not feel like mm. well not crazy I don't really like that word but like you can feel like really out of place on the negative end of the spectrum but then also like you get very excited and you love a lot deeper and like you show love a lot differently and like 
all you want is to be loved and adored. So like you show that to them. So like they say that borderlines love, like you'll never experience another love, like a borderline love. Yeah, it's so like, intense. <laughs> yeah, because it's so intense. So um, once you find someone who is accepting of all the other stuff, I think it can be very beautiful and, and they, yeah. they you're very childlike because you're almost like stuck in that childlike energy or that childlike mind state. And you're very sporadic and spontaneous sometimes, but also like routine and comfortability. So like it can be really exciting and really like invigorating being with a borderline because for someone who not, I wouldn't say it's boring, but like somebody who's sort of like normal functioning, it can be really yeah. fun and really like, yeah. you know, um different to being with someone who's just <laughs> normal yeah yeah and, yeah but what is normal you know exactly <laughs> i don't really think that there's anything normal is not even existing no and you said it it comes from trauma yes um so. is it always the case um yes i believe so they mm. say that it is a product of like the way that you're like the environment you were in when you're a kid. And um, so when you're, so a lot of, a lot of mental illnesses, like the, I've done a lot of research. I hyper fixated on the topic of, because my podcast is about mental illnesses and childhood trauma and becoming the best version of yourself. But to do that, you have to unpack what you've been through and unpack the trauma that you've experienced. And most people's trauma that is like, <clears throat> sorry, most people's trauma that's life altering or like changes your perception is from childhood. So like there's a um, psychologist called Gabor Mate. He's from Germany. And I listen to a lot of his teachings and he believes, truly believes that every single mental illness derives from how you were treated as a child. So the way that you show up as an adult is a direct reflection of how you were treated as a child and whether or not you think you're a product of childhood trauma. So, like, just say your parents were still together and you're very financially stable and, like, all that kind of stuff. But maybe your one of your parents was emotionally neglective and maybe they weren't there for you in moments that you really needed to for them to be there for you. So, like, in the ages of zero to five is where our brain develops our social, emotional and, um, like, all those skills plus our personality and if you're in a chaotic environment in those years, your brain doesn't develop properly because you're constantly in fight or flight mode. You're constantly like subconsciously like um, waiting. I guess not waiting for, but like you're in constant alert. So you're constantly like making sure that you're – like, or you'll dissociate completely. So, like, just say your parents are constantly fighting or, you know, you have a sibling that's a bully or just, like, whatever it is, sometimes people don't realise that that can also cause these issues. And so, like, okay. one of my parents did leave when I was very young. So that caused the abandonment. But I do know a girl, I have a friend who's borderline and her parents are still together and they're very financially well off and but she's been diagnosed with borderline but they've put it down to the fact that her mum is very emotionally unavailable and her dad wasn't really around because he was a businessman so like there's so many yeah. different variables and so many different things that come into account but essentially like I said there's a lot of psychologists that believe that most mental illnesses and most of the way you think about other things mm -hmm. in your perception of reality is because of how you were treated and the way your brain developed as a child and your beliefs you have around yourself and your beliefs that you have around how people treat other people. And that's yeah. like also in the way of like narcissists and narcissistic tendencies, like they're just as, um, you know, traumatized from their environment. And that's the only reason they've sort of developed those things. Whereas when you're an adult, so Gabor, I hope I'm saying his name right, um, Dr. Mate, I think is how you say it. Mm -hmm. He has done a lot of extensive research and he said, because he is from Germany and around the time 
either his parents or he was a part of like the Holocaust. So he said mm-hmm. that there's been research done on people, like a hundred people from the Holocaust and there's a as a research done on a hundred people from war. And he said that only twenty or so of each of the hundred were severely traumatized and weren't able to sort of get better afterwards. But the only yeah. thing those people had in common was that they had childhood trauma. So they had trauma prior to this PTSD, this trauma that was caused in their adulthood. So they say okay. if you experience trauma in your adulthood, which I would not ever, like, dumb down or, like, I would never, like, you know, um, separate them and say one's worse off than the other, but you have a sense of self prior to that mm-hmm. trauma in adulthood you have a sense of like perception and reality and like not everything's bad because beforehand you knew who you were you knew how the world works and then like this terrible thing happened to you and then afterwards you can get back usually to that person you were before whereas when you're a product of childhood trauma you don't develop necessarily a sense of self or a self-identity which is a huge part of borderline is that you have no sense of self you have no identity you don't sort of know who you are because for the years that you're meant to develop so between the ages of like five and eight is where you sort of solidify your personality you solidify like who you are and what you like and what you don't like and if you have parents who are supportive and understanding and like are able to guide you in those years so it doesn't need so it doesn't need to be like a big trauma actually it can also be like something really small and it can develop later yeah so it's like cptsd complex post-traumatic stress so just say over an elongated period of time so like it's the same with abuse in adulthood cptsd so like just say you're with an abusive partner or a neglectful partner and like they love you And they show love, but it's very conditional. So, like, you know, go do this, otherwise you're not getting a hug. Or, like, do this. Or, like, at the like, one of your parents may be very easily triggered themselves and be product of childhood trauma themselves, which I believe both of mine are. Um, Mm. They're easily set off and they're easily, like, triggered and then a lot of the time they can't control their emotions. So then you're constantly on high alert of like, oh, I don't want to upset them or I don't want to make them feel this way because when they do, I don't get love or when they do, I'm not like, you know, loved. So you have this deep like sense of like, I've got to do this or I've got to be this way or like, otherwise I'm not going to get what I need to be supported or I'm not going to get what I need to have my needs met. Yeah, yeah. It's a confusing thing and like I don't remember – a lot of my childhood, like I don't remember anything prior to like the age of 12, I think. Wow, okay. Um, 12, 13 is when I start having like memories. And like I do remember a little bit of my early, like just before that, but like my earlier years, the only memories I have, like the core memories are negative, are like trauma. So like the day my dad came back and, and took all our furniture and, and, like, left. And then, like, the day that this happened, like, you know, things were broken and, like, yelling and, you know, like, there was – I don't – and, like, I have photos. Mom has so many film photos from when we were kids so I can see mm-hmm. memories and I can and I can remember, you know, things based on those. Like, we always would go camping. She'd take us camping twice a year. Um, but, like – I don't remember them myself. I can only remember through seeing photos, whereas, like, most of my memories from prior to the age of, like, 12 or 13, wow. and even in my high school years, most of my memories are just trauma, like being wow. bullied or being abused or being bashed. And, like, there's a lot of things that happened that are very confusing for somebody to have to understand like why has this happened to me and why has yeah. so many of these things happened to me when I've only been trying to be loved the whole time yeah wow so you actually experienced also bullying in uh, high school after yeah I was um 
quite severely bullied in primary school and high school. I never really had um, a core group of friends. I sort of was friends with, like, one person in this group and, like, one person in the popular group, but, like, at lunchtime, like, neither of the groups would let me sit with the group. So, like, I would be kind of transient. And I never really had a core group of friends. I was always sort of on the outskirts. And even as I've gotten older, like, I get introduced to a group or, like, I have core friends, but they're all, like, none of them know each other. And then in high school, I moved schools three times. First school, I was bullied by my teacher, which obviously I wasn't diagnosed then, and I was a very traumatized little girl. So yeah, I wasn't able like I wasn't able to concentrate properly on school. I was like, yeah, just not. It was yeah, not very nice. And like I was bullied by a teacher, and then. A girl at school hit me mm. because she thought that I liked her boyfriend, or but like her boyfriend liked me, and like it was just really like weird toxic wow. situations that I didn't necessarily cause, but yeah. I was the one that had to deal with the brunt of it all. And so yeah, yeah grade eight, I was bullied by a teacher. I started wagging school because I didn't like going to his class. And then, yeah, of course, it, yeah. and then they were like, you should probably find another school. So, wow. like, I wasn't expelled as such, but I was told to leave. <laughs> and then I went to another school and I was sort of accepted in, like, in a group. And I had some really good friends at that school. Um, it was not the best school in my town because I'm from a town that's got a very um, big gap between sort of the – upper class and the lower class, if I, I guess. Yeah, and was, yeah, and yeah. So, like, the second school I went to had a lot of people that were a part of sort of the lower class. And so um, I made some really good friends, but they were also products of trauma. And then I had a friend who was being bullied and I stood up for her because I was somebody who would always stand up for what was right and I didn't really care what anyone thought. I was one of those girls who just, like... I was like, try me kind of thing because I was like, yeah. I've been through it. Yeah. So like, whatever. So I stood up for her and then the bully came after me and I ended up getting attacked after school and she and her friend came after me and I got hit from behind and then basically bashed and jumped on and they broke my ribs and I got a fractured cheekbone and oh, no was extremely bloodshot and um so yeah I was traumatized from that and then I tried to move schools again and the next school was like a private school and they're like you're not coming unless you up your grades so then in high school I had to like there was a period of time it was like a term which is about eight weeks to ten weeks so like in between the school holidays there's a term and that whole term I spent in the office because I couldn't I was afraid to go outside of the office because I didn't want to to be around any of those people. So I got my grades up and then I moved to another school and mum wouldn't let me not graduate. And I'm so grateful she made me graduate and finish grade 12. Mm -hmm. But because she wouldn't let me not graduate, I moved to this new school and I spent the last three years of my high school just head down, bum up. Like I had a couple of good friends, Um, but I'm not friends with any of them since high school so like that just goes to show how good of a friends they really were um yeah because yeah. yeah, i've not heard from any of them since high school and um yeah i just i just graduated i got my grade 12 certificate and then i basically fleed my hometown as quickly as i could <laughs> i don't even know if i was 18 yeah. yet before i decided to like move found a job found a place and yeah drove three hours south to somewhere just a little bit nicer nice yeah so you can start fresh that's really nice yeah i always had a dream of leaving my hometown to start fresh i always had a dream i didn't think it's a very small town and i didn't think um i didn't think that it was like i just wanted to get out 
as you can probably understand from all the things I went through and like the different stuff I had to experience, it's just I couldn't wait to get away to somewhere where nobody knew me, nobody yeah. knew my name. Yeah. Like because I moved schools three times and it's quite a small town and that's around the time when social media started becoming a thing. I actually was quite known around the town like a lot of people knew my name they didn't necessarily know me but they knew of me because of just like having so many different groups of people in so many different schools that knew who I was and then after I was like bashed then like a lot of people from other schools knew about that and like it was all over Facebook like there's just a lot of like shitty things that I guess no one even knew who I was or knew me to my core but they knew of me so I was like I'm I don't belong here. Like this isn't I just yeah. somewhere where nobody knew my name or my family name because where I'm from um, is where a lot of um, Italians, because I'm Italian, and my nonno, he migrated to Australia when he was 19 and so did a lot of other Italians and they kind of sort of were the foundations of my hometown. And a lot of people knew my last name because of my parents or because of my grandparents. And so, oh, you're a Givenoni, like, who's your dad? Like, which one's your Mm. father? And I was like, so that was the question that was constantly. And I was like, I'm not George, the daughter of, you know, I'm not George, the product of this. I'm just George. And I just want to be seen as, like, this person who is herself, not, you know, connected to all these other yeah ideas or all these other like beliefs of you know who I was when it wasn't really who I was yeah and how was it to move to another city it was refreshing I actually Mm. that was probably one of the most like the best things I did for myself I moved in with a household of girls that were a lot older and it they were travellers and they were very transient, very, like, it was a very good experience. I've got goosebumps because I love them so much. I haven't seen them in years, but, like, they taught me and showed me that life can be so different. Like, if I didn't have them as sort of idols or, like, people to look up to in those years, I don't know whether I would have done as much travelling as I did. I always wanted to travel. I always wanted to leave my country and go and look at the world. But three of the girls were sisters and they were from Ireland. And then a couple of other girls, they all knew each other from travelling in Europe and, like, being a part of, like, um, a, a group that sort of went around and worked in different places, like Oktoberfest or, like, different festivals. So, like, they were very, like, go away and then they'd come back to Australia and, mm. and um like, save money and then go away again. So, like, I had this very nice, beautiful, like, goal to get to and just go overseas. And I eventually did after a couple of years. But, yeah, they were very good people to have transitioned from my hometown to a new town. And then after that split up, I don't quite remember exactly because there was another traumatic period of my life in my early 20s or, like, just before I turned 20, actually. It was, like, sort of, like, 19, 20. And then I think I went back to my hometown for a couple of months. <clears throat> but, again, like I said, I don't remember a lot of that time. So um, I then moved back to where I would, like, had moved after I left. So, like, I went back and then went back again. Um, And, yeah, I don't really remember who I lived with after that, but it wasn't the best. Like, I remember I, after going back to where I was from and then back to the city again, I remember there was a lot of other traumatic situations that happened that then further confirmed some of my childhood trauma beliefs about myself and about the world and about people. Yeah. And so I was then shot straight back into this mindset of, like, people aren't good, like, you know. Yeah, you got triggered again. Like, yeah, so now I can, like, look back and analyse that. I understand why because your brain 
when you're a product of childhood trauma, it has this blueprint. It has this, like, belief system that you have to work really hard on letting go of about beliefs about yourself, about beliefs about other people and, like, about the world in general. And when you experience things in your adulthood that further confirm those beliefs, like whether you're in a job that's not the best job or whether you're in a friend group that's, like, a little bit toxic or, like, they treat you badly but you don't realise, but then, like, it kind of, like, then skews your perception of reality again and it's harder to then get out of it. So I think those years were then, again, quite toxic and took me back to that bad place. And then that was when I had my first boyfriend. So that was an experience in itself because obviously, like I said, loving with borderline is a very difficult thing to navigate. Yeah, yeah. Um, And I was with him for quite a while. And then I left because I just, I don't know, I we were living together and I just, I wasn't quite, I happy or satisfied and I know it wasn't that I wasn't happy or satisfied with him it was because I wasn't happy or satisfied with myself but I couldn't quite put my finger on that I couldn't quite explain that so I left I wanted to experience being by myself I wanted to experience living with friends I was only like 20 or 21 at the time maybe no 20 I wasn't even 21 yet um and then I moved into a household with some like people my age And uh, my best friend, who is also quite a traumatised person. So, like, we bounced off each other and we connected and gelled very well. But we were also quite toxic for each other because we kept each other sort of in that, like... Yeah, negative spiral. Yeah, but we were, like, glue. Like, we were each other's rock. And, like, I haven't seen her for years. We really need to catch up. She lives... She's not far from me, but... I think she separated herself from me because she thought that she was bad influence on me. She was causing my stuff to keep coming up. Um, But once I took responsibility for my own shit, I sort of realised that everybody has to be responsible in some way. Yeah, it's true. Yeah person to blame in any relationship or any situation because everybody has their shit everybody comes from some something or somewhere like I said you could have trauma or beliefs or like something that makes your brain work the way it does or the way you react to people and like everything contributes to a situation like there's your side there's my side and there's the truth and that means like your perception Mm -hmm my perception yeah. and those are based off of our own experience and our own experiences are different and then the truth is usually just like it is what it is but I'm seeing it this through this lens and you're seeing it through this mm-hmm. lens but both of the lenses could be very skewed so like it's important to remember that when you are yeah. somebody who's aware yeah. of your trauma because like even now going into situations or now when someone has a go at me or they're upset about something or like whatever it is, I just take a step back and I'm like, okay, what lens are they looking through? Why are they so defensive right now? Why are they treating me like this? Are they having a bad day? Are they like, you know, did someone treat them wrongly today or did the way that I say it trigger them because they feel like I'm coming across, you know, because I'm very blunt and very honest. And I think this is just something that I've developed because I don't beat around the bush because when you beat around the bush, it's like things can get lost in translation. Yeah. Things can get skewed. So, like, I've learned to just be straight to the punch. Like, it is like this for me. So, like, mm-hmm. what's it like for you? And people don't always like that. No, it's true, yeah. <laughs> they take it, like, personally. Yeah. A lot of people take things oh. personally, but the thing is nothing in life is personal. Mm. Like everything's an opportunity to learn and grow and every experience is an opportunity to change and become a better person. So if you're not taking these opportunities and experiences with other humans as a way to change and grow, you're just going to be stuck in that victim mentality. You're going to be stuck in that like, oh, poor me, life's happening to me. <laughs> like, not yeah. for me. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. 
a beautiful place to get to now I'm here. Yeah. But I still, I still struggle. Yeah. And also, do you also have like uh, spiritual experiences because yeah. you're really passionate so and yeah. really alive? So maybe you're also really open for that? Yes. Yeah, so before I became aware, I wasn't the most spiritual person. I grew up with a mom who was super into like, like she, she's spiritual, like she's into tarot, she's into like, um, like, she read a lot of Louise Hay books. Like there was, it was in my environment. Like she was trying to heal herself. So I had a lot of those things sort of like there, but I never really like delve into them until after I was sort of like 22, 23. I think the first person that introduced me into a different way of thinking was Alan Watts. Do you know of Alan Watts? Yeah, he's a philosopher. Yeah. He's been he's passed and he's been gone for like fifty or so years now. But he, in the way he views the world and the way he talks about the universe and the way like that was my first initial like oh, and I actually remember exactly the day, exactly the video. This girl, she's quite famous. She's gorgeous, Sahara Ray. She posted this video on her story and said, "Alan Watts is like my." all-time favorite teacher of life and I listened to the video and I was like this guy yeah. like he, he's got like there's something in what he said and I was like okay and then I listened to a lot more of his teachings a lot more of his talks because he was a philosopher but he was a teacher at a university and he did a lot of like speeches um and, yeah, the way that he viewed the world and the way – he's a very spiritual person as well, but he's, he's like, kind of on the science side of things as well. So he, he's, like, a good person to start with. And then after yeah. I discovered him, not long after that, I discovered Abraham Hicks. So, like, Esther and yeah. Mary Hicks. I don't know if you've heard of them. but Yeah, also, yeah. Yeah, like so it, yeah. then that is what, put, like, catapulted me into the spiritual world because she – channels like Abraham and she says all these things and it's not coming from her it's coming from this like exterior source and like some of the stuff she was saying I was just resonating so hard with and like learning so much just by listening and I know ever since I was little I've been told like I'm an old soul like I never really gelled well with people my age I've always been friends with people who are older or even like adults and like the way that I understand and the way that I perceive things is very, like, profound for a little kid. Like, even when I was a teenager or, like, younger than that, a lot of adults would be like, you're different. And I never really, like I said, had um, friends, so I spent a lot of time alone. And my neighbour, when I was a kid, I was looked after by her a lot. and She was a lot older. But she said I used to be in the backyard just, like, off with the fairies, talking to myself. Just, so I must have been a very spiritual kid, but then, like, yeah. sort of through trauma, it, you get lost in the world and yeah. the perception of reality and, like, you get very separated from that version of yourself. Like, you're very connected when you're a kid, when you're born. Like, I'm a childcare worker, so I experience kids mm -hmm. a lot and a lot of different kids, and I've seen, you know, kids talk to things or kids look at things that, like, aren't there, and it makes you wonder, like, what are they seeing and what are they hearing that I can't? Yeah. So, like, I don't eliminate that possibility that I was very in tune. And then I think a lot of people who go through trauma are quite in tune and are for a higher purpose, but they get lost from that connection and they get lost from that purpose through the trauma. And then once you rediscover and redefine yourself, you get connected again. And recently more and more <clears throat> healing myself, I've become more and more connected again. And, like, since mm -hmm. the teachings of Abraham and Alan Watts and, like, recently I've discovered, um, what's his name? Uh, he was a monk and he left the monastery because so, he wanted to teach more people about, um, hold on, let me just see what his name is. It's completely <laughs> from my mind. Right you now. need to know. <laughs> um, Jay Shetty. 
Mm. Jay Shetty. Have you oh, yes. Jay? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's a podcast. Yeah, like, he's I love a him. He's like, in tune person as well. And I've listened to a lot of his stuff recently. And I just, I realized I had a different outlook on life. I realized I understood things a lot differently. Because when I talk about this stuff to some people, they're like, oh. I didn't really think of it like that or like as you've seen my TikTok yeah. you see how I explain and articulate things it's very like open-minded and very out there and a lot of people don't um a lot of people don't think like that and then they see a video of mine and they're like oh I never I never thought of it that way or you you explain that in a very beautiful way and I you know, I see it differently now. And so when I realized I had a different way of viewing life and I had a different way of experiencing things and everything I do comes from love and comes from compassion and empathy and I think a lot deeper, I think, than a lot of people, that's when I realized I had a purpose. That's when I realized, like, oh, there's something different about me. And so through my healing journey, some of the biggest spiritual experiences I had so, like, I'll tell you a story. So I I went overseas. I moved to Canada in 2019 just before COVID. And, and around that time, I can, I can hands down say I wasn't very awake. Like, I wasn't very conscious or aware of, like, me or the way that, that things were happening. I was very victim mindset. I was very, like, the world's happening to me. Like, I'm so sick of this shit. Like, why is everything always happened to me? Yeah, yeah. I went over there. COVID hit that was one of the worst experiences because I had to then leave this life that I had gone to work so hard to create and moved overseas spent so much money and I like was just becoming comfortable there and then they were like okay we're shutting everything the mountains closed we're closing businesses like you've got to go home there's no work there's no whatever Mm. I know COVID was a traumatic experience for everyone but I then had to move back home and be in limbo because like that was my plan for the next two years was to be in Canada and then I came home and I was shut and so I was home for like six months and again like I was a bit better but still not quite aware or awake or conscious and I was you know wanting to be taken care of and wanting to be looked after and I just wasn't quite taking responsibility for my own shit and then I had the opportunity to go back and I went back and when I got back about when I was home, sorry, I did start like getting into yoga. I started getting into meditation, but I was just sort of dipping my toes in because I did have a yoga pass in exchange for cleaning. And I would go to like say the yin and meditation. Like I'd only just started experiencing meditation. I just started experiencing slow movement because before I would do like the Pilates or the hot yoga which is very strenuous on your body and you don't get a chance to think or sit. And then when I mm. I was, like, not super for yin and meditation because I don't – it's uncomfortable, like, when you get, have to sit with your thoughts and sit with yourself. Yeah, it's really overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, so then I first started experiencing meditation and yin yoga and I started experiencing – like when my eyes were closed I started experiencing seeing visualizations and seeing like colors and swells and like feelings of emotion come up and like they say like you heal trauma through movement like body movement is a huge part of healing trauma because energy becomes stagnant in your body and you know we hold like trauma in certain places and until you move it and integrate it like it doesn't come out like you have to feel it Mm -hmm. and so I started experiencing that and then, like, didn't sort of delve too far into it. But then when I went back to Canada, I had an experience. So that that yoga studio, just for reference, was called Phoenix Yoga. And if you know about the phoenix in the spiritual world, that is, like, death and rebirth, like, coming up from the ashes. And so when I went to Canada, um, back to Canada, I bought a van and... I was planning on using it for summer, but until then it was kind of my home because I hadn't had accommodation organized for me yet. The van ended up being faulty and the engine had been replaced twice. And when I was jump starting it one day, the engine blew up and quite literally blew fire and and into my face and I caught fire and because the van's engine was on the inside of the van, like it's not on the outside. Mm -hmm. So I was trapped inside the van 
on fire oh, well. while the engine was on fire. Oh and my I'm god! So I thank my lucky stars that my friend was there with me because if I didn't have someone there with me, I would have been way more severely burnt or dead because he pulled pulled me out. He reached in over the fire and dragged me out, and that was like a crazy experience everyone was like why don't you go home like I was like I've been here for two weeks and I've been waiting six months to get back and like I'm not going home so I had third and fourth degree burns to my hands and my face I lost like half a head of hair I, ha- I could have been way more burnt if he didn't get me out when he did but I I didn't know then but like when I look back now like that I wasn't listening to the universe like I was getting these nudges I was getting these reminders like I kept chasing after something that at the time probably wasn't something I should have been chasing after. I should have just been being present for myself. I should have just been doing what I wanted to do instead of chasing this other yeah. thing. And then that was just the slap in the face from the universe. That was like, hey, we're trying to show you what you should be doing and you're ignoring us. So, like, slow the fuck yeah. down. Like, we're going to whip you into place. So, like, then I had this fire experience and I, I like remember the Phoenix, like, and so once yeah. I like slowed down from this fire cause I couldn't work. I was completely stripped of all my money. I was like, I had got helicoptered to Vancouver. There was a lot of experiences within that experience that caused me to be like, okay, I've got to just be there for myself. And so yeah. healing from that was one of the worst things I ever had to do because when you're healing from third and fourth degree burns, because it only touches the top of your nerves, you feel like you're on fire the whole time you're healing because your nerves are coming back and healing. So for two, three weeks I was on tablet morphine and I don't remember much. I just had to sort of get through it. And then once I got through it, I was like, okay, I can kind of get through anything now. And the more and more I listened, like the whole time I was sort of getting more into Alan Watts. I was, I had started Borderline George, my business, before I, like when I went to Canada the first time, sorry, and then worked on it a little bit while I was back home. But then when I had my accident, that's when I was like, okay, maybe there's this higher purpose for this borderline, George. Like I started creating stickers. I started creating prints. I started learning more about borderline. That's when I started listening to my first podcast and learning about borderline. So it all kind of started to sort of fall into place. And then I moved town in Canada to another place, which is um, a very healing location. It's called Banff. It's in Alberta and it's, it, this little town that's situated between like three, like the Rocky Mountains, but there's like three mountains that are there that are said to be quite like spiritual and quite like a healing location. Oh, okay. And I started at a yoga studio there and I, I had a meditation. Like I went to yin and yoga and I got back into it and that's when I released, I got goosebumps, that's when I released wow. a lot of things and a lot of mindsets and I started experiencing this other like that's all like like source like this other thing that wasn't physical it wasn't like a thing it was just like I was seeing colors and I was experiencing these feelings in my body and I was like Mm. integrating this trauma and integrating these lessons and I had kept having epiphanies and I was like the universe had kept trying to nudge me onto the right track. And I think, like I said, this is my purpose, talking about mental health, helping people find their joy and peace. But the universe had kept nudging me. Now I look back, like the Phoenix Yoga Studio and then the fire. And then I experienced in a meditation, I no joke, saw a phoenix and I saw like this oh, wow. like, thing. And I was like, and then I got a reading and the person told me that one of my spirit guides one of my spirit animals is a phoenix and one and the phoenix is like one of the highest regarded spirit animals and it's a fire like it's a fire bird and it's like rising from the ashes so like i had to get to the to the rock bottom like i had to hit rock bottom and then it was almost like this sign of like now you can come back and now you can rise from the ashes and like when I came back from Canada and like in the first couple of months 
like I dyed my hair red and it was almost like I stepped into this new version of myself and like I cried when she revealed my hair to me and I was like I feel so much more myself and like it was all these profound experiences of just finding myself and finding my purpose but I'm the only one who can kind of like timeline them and piece them together to that makes sense to me but yeah, that's like yeah. a spiritual experience like that's like I wasn't super spiritual before and then through all of these little experiences like in the fire like my my grandmother passed away quite a few years ago and I believe that when she passed was when I started to become awoke and started to become aware and I think she's on the other side helping me and so mm-hmm. um I yeah, just started experiencing these little things and I got to piece together all these things and I was like, okay, like I'm being guided and the more I followed that guidance, the more I followed that path, the easier and less resistant and like the better everything started to become. Like it's still been a hard yeah. like hard road since I got back, which was June last year. So it's almost 12 months now. It's about eight months since I got back from Canada. But all of that experience, all of that spirituality, all of that growth happened in those years of like from leaving, starting Borderline George because I had this just like idea. I did. I started with beanies because I was in the snow. I always wanted to have a business and work for myself. I never wanted to have work for someone else. And so I started the business just because I wanted to like bring awareness to mental health because I was struggling with mine. So I was like, i got to help other people with theirs. And then yeah. I strayed away from the business and didn't put as much effort and time and energy into it. And then that's what I think the universe was like, no, George, like, keep going with that. Yeah. Keep going yeah. with that business. Keep following that dream. And the more mm-hmm. and more I did, and now since starting TikTok, like I started TikTok like 12 months ago when I was in Canada, when I was in Banff. And if you scroll way back to, like, that time, you can see I wasn't wow. as I wasn't as leveled up or where I am now as I was when I started. But yeah. Then I've profoundly like brought myself back from that depth of like, like I didn't want to be here anymore. Like I wasn't, I was done yeah. experiencing the shit. I was like, come on. Yeah. yeah. It's like, give me some good stuff. Like I'm a good person and treat everyone. So Enough good. lessons now. Yeah. And now. I'm just like getting rewarded left, right, and center, and I'm like, it does get better. Like, I do still have days where I'm like, okay, I'm done. Like, I don't want, I don't want to be here anymore. Earth school's just too much. Like, I want to go back to being a spirit and being free. But yeah, it's I'm here to guide and help others. And mm-hmm. once I just stepped into that truth in the last like month or two, mm-hmm. it's been incredible. So like. Yeah, I guess my spirituality evolved through experience and following those nudges from the universe and that mm-hmm. massive slap in the face, which a lot of people I know in the, the healing space and this world mm-hmm. will say that they did have some kind of, like, slap in the face from the universe. Yeah. That you can either heed as a lesson and take on or you can ignore and keep ignoring and it keeps becoming more and more uncomfortable. So, like, yeah. it's really your choice at the end of the day whether you, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, allow it to happen. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. And you sound so strong and it's really, like, inspiring, like, how you live from out love right now and not in a victim mode anymore. And you're now in such, like, a good flow. Mm. And when everything is going so easy, then you know you're on the right path. Yeah, the I really believe that. Yeah, and also, I think just for being you, you're already inspiring. So yeah. I don't think you don't even have to try a lot because you're already living like In you, truth. and that's already inspiring. So yeah, I think yeah, thank very, you so much. It's confronting to some people because. A lot of people hide stuff behind, you know, they hide behind a mask, they hide behind a front to protect themselves. Yeah. But because I have no front, I have no mask anymore, I'm just completely authentically myself, it can be very confronting yeah. and abrupt. And people yeah. are like, oh, what's this girl about? Like, this is a bit funny. But then they realize I'm actually being genuine and authentic and they're like, okay, she's doing something yeah. right, let's follow her. 
Yeah, it's true. And also the mission of this podcast is about being unapologetic and live uh, without any shame because shame is actually the lowest frequency it you is. can have. It is. Shame so, is. so I think embracing yourself and just be completely yourself is so important in life. Yeah, I love your name of your podcast because my bio, I'm not sure if you noticed on my Instagram. Yeah, I saw that, yeah. It has <laughs> been that for years and it's be so unapologetically yourself that it only encourages others to do the same because if everyone yeah. was more themselves, maybe we wouldn't have to deal with so much shit and we could be just yeah. honest and open and people would be understanding more because there would be no like, you know, because intuition, you know, we feel what someone wants to say. We feel what someone wants to do. But when they are disconnected from that truth, when they are disconnected from themselves and don't show what you know they want to show, it then makes you feel disconnected. It makes you feel like, oh, there's something off here. I don't know what it is, it, but it's actually yeah. just the person not showing up as them, what they want to show up as. And that's just yeah. trauma, essentially. Like, I've come to learn... That's why I'm trying to introduce it as a trauma thing, not a spiritual thing, because people can understand the way the brain works more. But I feel like we have a brain, which is conditioning and, and something that's a part of the 3D and the ego and the pride. But we also have a spirit. We have a soul that that is it is what it is when we're born and we're connected to it. But like I said, throughout life, throughout things that we experience, you become disconnected from yourself and from your core soul yeah. and then you get introduced to conditioning and that's when ego comes in and that's when you make choices you don't want to make and you're just like why yeah. did i do that yeah yeah but that's that's also another lesson yeah <laughs> and everyone has yeah. their own lessons to learn hey like yeah life's different you can't hold someone's hand the whole time like they've got to just do no. it themselves yeah um Thank you so much for sharing your story. And um, I would like to wrap it up for now. Yeah. But I will put all your social media links in the description. And you're also starting your own podcast soon. Yes, I am releasing um, my podcast and my website because I'm an artist. So I'm re-releasing my website. Um, so I'll send that to you as well. So you can put that. Perfect. In. I will put every li all the links in the description. Uh, but before we leave, do you have some final words to say to the audience? Um, if you always do what you always did, you will always get what you always got. So if you want to change and you want something different, you've got to start showing up different. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds so cheesy, but it's true. It yeah, is. it's so it's true. So true. Because you just have to believe in yourself. Like if, when you believe in yourself, anything's possible. Like you've got to forget yeah. about the exterior, because that essentially doesn't really matter. Yeah, I love that. Mm. Well, thank you everyone for listening. Yeah, and I will see everybody me. in the next episode. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Well. Bye bye. Bye.